नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू अनदर नाइन ओ क्लॉक लाइव अच्छा नाउ टुडे आई एम नॉट गोइंग गिव यू बिग इंट्रोडक्शन एंड ऑल दैट आई एम नॉट आई हैव अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट गेस्ट एंड आई हैव अ वेरी 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 ऑनर्ड आई मीन आई एम एब्सोल्युटली ऑनर्ड टू हैव हिम एज अ गेस्ट टुडे आई एम गोइंग टू इंट्रोड्यूस यू टू मिस्टर मोहन गुरुस्वामी हु डजंट नीड मच ऑफ इंट्रोडक्शन बिकॉज़ पीपल हु आर हु रीड पॉलिटिक्स हु अंडरस्टैंड पॉलिटिक्स नोज हिम हैज रेड हिज वर्क he was the advisor to the finance minister of india that is uh, yashwan sinha he is a author he is a journalist he is an ad man he is a lot of things and most importantly he is somebody i followed a lot over the years i read a lot of his articles and his posts so let's get right into the show and let's talk to mr mohan kuruswami right sir thank you so much for joining us thank you so much for joining us it's such an honor honestly it is a great honor to have you in my show and it's a great honor to actually speak to you like this so wow it's a fan moment for me so uh, please excuse me if i fumble please excuse me if i if i uh, you know uh, yeah sir um, let's get right into the questions sir i want to start this uh, conversation slightly different sir what attracted you to the bharatiya janata party at one point in time you see i was i started my political innings so to say with a man called chandrashekar i was a great fan and admirer of chandrashekar and i had i was on my way to harvard to study economics in in 82 when i met him on the plane he was sitting next to me and i got to know him and we exchanged telephone numbers and when i came back and he said when you come back come and look me up so we were on a flight from hyderabad to cochin so the hopping flight hyderabad to bangalore bangalore to cochin he was just defeated janta uh, the party was defeated by indira gandhi in the comeback and uh, so he was Traveling alone, and there was a bunch of people receiving him. So we had a long time to talk. Two hours in Bangalore, change of flights. You know, we had those Avro planes those days. Anyway, so I got to know him, and when I came back in '84, he had just was finishing his padyatra, and I went to see him, and he said, "Right, I want you to now come and sit with me, and we work on." the politics and the economics of what should be done so i became this kind of speech writer ideas man tossing you know to toss ideas and you know work with him but people used to think that i was a security guard go oh. <laughs> i'll be so this rat put so on so be you can be angra sake okay so shake the color of you you know because I was a hunter, kind of six foot three, and very muscular those days. So anyway, I used to go with them to Bihar, and uh, so that is where I got my training and interest. So theoretical knowledge of economics combined then with practical knowledge of Bihar politics, and I met all the legendary characters in Bihar those days, you know, through him, including uh, the Dhanbad Mafia and uh, the socialists in Patna. Lalu Yadav and all these guys. So that was my introduction to politics, and I loved it. And Rajiv Gandhi had just won the elections with 410 seats or something absurd like that, 52 percent of the popular vote. And this is a Juno, you know. You want to bring him out from his high seat, and this whole business of family dynasty, mother handing over to. And I also disapproved of the. I call it a constitutional coup. That Rajiv Gandhi was sworn in by Jai Singh as president without being elected by the Congress Parliamentary Party. Correct. That was the most factor. It was, it was a coup, but it went typically in India unnoticed. So I was fret about all these things and became full time. And then VP Singh came along. Then I became VP Singh's 
man to some extent i used to do some of his speeches and so on into first few speeches in after he was kicked out of government i had to do it so i got involved in politics and it was great you know be in the bonnet to have you know uh, get it of these guys not that these guys are going to be any better but when you when you have a target of 400 this like this guy is today it's it's very romantic that you are and uh, i had a company job uh, also which allowed me to do all these things my boss was very nice man the man coach that she ran the tent now and he said do what you want here mohan you know very good friends and you know uh, only don't get me into trouble so i was free i to travel around and do all these things and uh, what do you need in delhi if you are in politics you have a house and a car and a monthly paycheck perfect setting to be in politics uh so i ran around with these guys and then these guys imploded and in the course of all these negotiations going on i used to run errands sometimes for vp singh and chandrasekhar with people like advani was by carrying messages getting things done and advani got to know me and kind of took a bit of a shy to me saying that you know bright fellow knows economics knows politics knows stats knows the numbers and all that i was a great number cruncher and uh, so when janta party janta dal all collapsed i was sitting at home doing nothing and he said why don't you help me out this is how i got him so without joining the party i became his advisor and he was very nice to me lk advani's advisor as well i found him a very pleasant man he had finished all his first pratyatra and all and i became his kind of ideas man and we did so many things you know i wrote the documentation i wrote the manifesto in 2000 uh, 1996 i wrote the foreign policy part the economics part So I was in the manifesto committee, uh, but I was not in the hierarchy in the sense that a member of the national executive, like I was in the Janata Party. But I never joined all that. I didn't become a party hack, and uh, I never got involved with the RSS. That's where all these fellows grew up to all would hang around. But you got to know all these chaps, and then when. There was a little coup in Vajpayee's first preference for finance minister was just one thing, and the entire Bombay lobby, which included you know was led by Dilubai Mani, didn't want just one thing to be in the finance ministry. So the, you know they had he had a solid lobby for him in the BJP, and they all went up to Advani and said whatever happens. That one thing cannot be fair. Fair as well. Why would so, that be, sir? Because Ambani didn't want this one. Thing. Okay. Very simple. Ambani. This one thing was on Nasli Wadia's land. Oh. And you know they had business relationships and all kinds of things. So let's not go into that. Uh, but Diru Bai Ambani didn't want this one thing as fair as well. So, and it was seen that Adwani went to Vajpayee and said. The something can't be planned. Finance minister. Then was why he said, "Get me a finance minister there." So Advani came back to us and said, "Look, who's the candidate for finance minister?" So I said, "Just one thing, sir. He was just one of the election in Hazari Bagh." So I called him up in Hazari Bagh and I said, "Advani ji wants you here. Come with a bandgala and a or a sherwani tomorrow morning." So Yashwan was appointed by VP Singh as a Minister of State. You know that incident. He went for the swearing-in, thinking that he's going to be a cabinet minister, and he was announced as an MOS. So he walked out of Rashtrapati Bhavan. Oh. In the VP Singh government. So he said, "I hope that is not going to happen to me again." I said, "No. This is a good job. This is a job you did with Chandrasekhar Ji. He was Chandrasekhar's finance minister. Okay. So you come here. That's how Yashwan Sinha came." then he was my whole when i was asked what do you want to do i said i want to go as ambassador to south africa mm. so 
आई रिमेम्बर वाजपेयी से वाई साउथ अफ्रीका प्रसिद्ध साहब वहाँ अंग्रेजी बोलते हैं वहाँ क्रिकेट खेलते हैं और वहाँ वाइल्ड लाइफ एंड आई वॉन्ट टू गो देर मिनिस्टर My file was not going beyond British Minister. So British That's Minister right. didn't. So Jaswant Singh then appointed me as advisor without the pay. Okay. So that was one rupee salary. So oh. the file didn't have to be approved by the PM because okay. it was secretary rank, but on one rupee. Okay. So only a bureaucrat would have known that. So he okay. said, "Mohan, you will avoid going to the PMO for a sanction." so i was sitting there in the finance ministry with the principal secretary of the prime minister not wanting me there acha okay so okay. you know so that's how i was there and you know rest is all history the uh, principal secretary and his, the prime minister's son in law would want things to be done and i would put my foot down and mess around with it like take over of itc by bat and this way is kind of things you know and uh, Rajendra Bharadwaj, of course, the son-in-law was very powerful, mm. yes. and uh, so people forget. Uh, but government with the difference was not much of a government with the difference. Party with the difference was just the same. I remember when I came out of the government, there was a meeting in Jitendra Prasad's house. Jitendra Prasad was Narasimha Rao's political secretary. Okay. Jitendra Prasad's house. With Manmohan Singh, Pranab Mukherjee, all these Congress big shots, they asked me, said, Mohan, what is your problem with these guys? So I said, Sir, all my, I told Manmohan Singh that all our life, all my life, I had been fighting against the kind of government the Congress runs. And when I came into government, I realized that these guys are no different from you. So that was the uh, introduction so to, to to these guys. Anyway, I didn't join the Congress Party. I stayed out. That was uh, then I started writing as a columnist, and I still had a, a corporate job, and I had I still had my little gadi gora and how. Sir, and how house. how how was how was the BJP then different to the BJP now? Was there a difference, or is it this? Was this BJP difference? then was a very democratic party. L K S Wan was an incredible man. And so was Vajpayee. They would have meetings every day. The, the Bharatiya Janata Party office would have meetings on every subject: nuclear policy, policy with how do we, what kind of relationship we should have with Vietnam would be a subject for discussion. And then you know, ten guys would sit and talk about it, and notes would be made. They used to be great people for notes, note bana. So budgets, how to deal with. Different economic policies, how to respond to Narasimha Rao saying something about trickle-down economics, and you know, Madhuani would immediately reply that trickle-down economics is like feeding feeding oats to horses so that sparrows can eat the dung. You know, all these things we used to put up every day. It was good fun, great fun, and it was very good in a party democracy. And even Vajpayee would. Be agreed to be overruled when the committee would say no, 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 no. Until he, we don't agree with you on this. He said, "Take it." Like for instance, he wanted registration of conversion by the district collector, and and he wanted that in the manifesto. But the manifesto committee ruled him out. Said, "No, you can't have this. People have a right to change their religion whenever they want. That's a fundamental right. It comes out of freedom of speech." नहीं 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 ठीक है बट ये ठीक है मगर आप लोग तो कहते तो मैं मानता हूं दिस इज द डिफरेंस एंड आई न्यू दिस मैन हु इज द प्रेजेंट प्राइम मिनिस्टर ही यूज्ड टू शेयर द आउट हाउसेस विद गोंदाचार्य 
Modi and various people used to be there. And they were the backroom boys in the BJP. They were little fix, little rallies and meetings and, you know, run errands with the sun. They were the talking chaps with the RSS. But, uh, Advani, you know, Narendra Modi, Advani liked him. Narendra Modi, somehow he, he took a liking for Modi and, you know, he groomed him. But I remember when he became chief minister of Gujarat. I told, I had a meeting with Advani Agri on something else and I said that lions in Gujarat will one day die in, in one episode. Because they are in one tight area. 400 and odd lions. If one mm -hmm. episode, they will all die. So everybody, the Forest Research Institute of India, everybody wanted another lion sanctuary in India to protect the animal against the body. So I went and explained it to him and he wrote a note. And Narendra Modi refused it. He said the pride of Gujarat is linked with those lions. So the Kunopala where he's got the cheetahs, that was prepared for the lion. Oh. So he now put the cheetahs there so that the lion can never be introduced there. Because the, the Supreme Court order also saying that you must transfer lions to Kunopal in, in, in Madhya Pradesh. So he is in disobedience of the Supreme Court's order. Okay. Yeah. And I then told Advani, I said, sir, he doesn't listen to you now. He will never listen to you when rises this high. And of course, you know, there was this matter of Aran Pandya, who was the Home Minister of Gujarat at the time that pogrom took place. And Haran Pandya was killed a year later. All these matters were there. I said, you know, you are living dangerously with a dangerous man. And he paid the price heavily. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, Nanda Modi is a very ruthless man. You know, exceptionally determined. But no Economics, no politics, no, except that he knew that Muslim bashing pays off in a very visceral, guttural sense. And there's no discussion in the BJP. That BJP, which was, you know, had a great tradition of inner party democracy, which the Congress Party didn't have. At that time, I used to laugh that only two parties which had inner party democracy was the CPM, where they'd have a lot of meetings and discussions, and the BJP, the two extreme parties, had inner party democracy. The Congress party was, you know, family worship. Uh, and then the other parties were all family worship, DMK and Telugu Desam. So these are the two great parties, but that is also gone. CPM, of course, is kind of. Except but this Muslim bashing bit, uh, wasn't it started by L.K. Advani, sir? I mean... Uh, uh, no, Advani is very interesting, you know. Advani was hoping to be moved towards... You know, once I had asked Advani, how did you join the RSS? So he said, in Karachi, when I was young, school, we used to be... Muslim youth used to be a little troublesome. So we all liked this RSS because waving danda and you know marching around you know it made us feel good. But what is the philosophy? Self-protection. They all came with that kind of a feeling and then realized that you know government was much more than that. Advani particularly had begun reading a lot of books. You know, you know I got a whole bunch of economics books by Amartya Sen and various people. He was a voracious reader. And then he was trying to turn the BJP from a right-wing Hindu nationalist party to a conservative Hindu-leaning party. Which is so a, by, by asking to destroy uh, Babri Masjid? Because he is no, the one who led that... Uh, Babri Masjid. The Babri Masjid was there before. Even Hadwani started anything. The... the 
Babri Majid was going on from 49. Supreme Court. But I remember I was took part in the meetings with Chandrasekhar Ji on Babri Masjid. He used to tell people like Shahabuddin, don't adopt. Shahabuddin used to say, you first prove to me that there was a Ram. Chandrasekhar Ji said, it can't be proved. But don't speak like this. This is a country with a Hindu majority here. You can't taunt them like this. You can't make them appear helpless. There will be a reaction. But ask how did these people behave? Babri Masjid Action Committee. They used to say, you know, my khun bahega. Rivers of blood would flow. After all, there's an action and reaction to it. Advani being a good politician read it and the BJP wanted it. Saying, look at these guys. And you know, mind you, BJP was down to two seats. After Rajiv Gandhi came to power, two seats. Even Vajpayee was defeated. So he needed something, and I we could see it. And the Babri Masjid, I don't know. I asked him about Babri Masjid time and again. I said, "Did you know of the demolition?" He said, "No." He said, "Trust me. I didn't know. I was standing there, and I was shocked." And you look at the the videos of that. You could see in his face the man was helpless. He was looking shocked and pained. Even Vajpayee said time and again, Ki, I never wanted it. But these hard heads in the Sang, the Modi's and all these guys, they were the guys who, who swung it. Bal Thakre, she said, have volunteers who went up on top. And it, when he started paying off from two, they went to 140. Obviously, it was paying off. Correct. So an encouragement to become more and more religiously radical. Correct. Sir, I want to come to the question in hand, the topic in hand. How do you rate the 10 years of Modi Sarkar? I'll give you a very simple. In 2004, India's GDP was $700 billion. In 2014, it was two trillion dollars. Ballpark figure. 2024. Sorry, in 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 2007, uh, 2014, it was 700 million. 2014, it became two trillion. That's when Modi was given. So every seven years or so, every six to seven years, GDP was doubling. Now, from 2014 at 2 billion, it is short of 4 trillion. So the growth trajectory is slowed down. We should have doubled in the seventh year and then drawn by another 50% after that. Now, that growth trajectory is gone. He broke it with demonetization, he broke it with all kinds of strange policies, he didn't do the banking reform cleanup. At, at COVID, when everybody went for pump priming the economy, even the United States printed $2 trillion. 20% of GDP was printed and injected in the economy. He refused. He didn't, they didn't inject a pipe in the economy, broke the back of the economy. To the of the economy is broken. You're down to, and now you can lie about it. You can keep lying about data, but the fact is that, you know, you have no FDI has dropped. FDI is down to 18 billion this year from 28 billion last year. At one time it was 70 billion in 2016 or so. So where are these numbers going? So who is investing in India? And then you have the number of billionaires going up. Income inequality is now 0.68. No other country in the world has this income inequality. So how do you judge this man? Have you created jobs? Today, paper says that 30% of IIT Bombay graduates not employed. IIT Bombay, Hawaii, you know, the, the, probably the best of the IITs. His graduates don't get employed. You can fly pagodas now. 
Sir, uh, my, sorry. Economy is not doing well. Economy is not doing well. And man is nurturing a huge lie. You go to bomb Balakot and all your bombs miss the target. And then you say Balakot was a great victory. Then you buy a plane which the Air Force Selection Committee had picked for 700 crores, 600 crores each. And then you place an order for 1600 crores and said that it has special fittings on it. What special fittings? Everybody says it's the same aircraft, aircraft we negotiated then and what they bought in 2018. Even the French say that. And he gets a evidence in an envelope handed over to a chief justice who is facing B2 charges for uh, trying to molest a PA in his office. And in a dubious decision, the Supreme Court forms a, a triumvirate which exonerates him. And then the guy goes out of being chief justice and then becomes a Nazi Sabha member. So, you know, they do these things open. And we're lying about everything. That when the, today, the, the executive, the Indian executive director in the IMF, the IMF has issued a public statement saying that the IMF's projection of India's economic growth is 6%, not 8%, which the Subramanian is saying. And that is his personal opinion. He issues that statement as EDU IMF. They do play this constant little game of lie, trying to now look at the media. Do you see anything? Today, all channels were showing Modi speaking in Rajasthan. At the same time, the Congress was releasing its manifesto in Hyderabad. Huge meeting. Lacks of people there. No coverage. You can own the media. You can beat the after who owns the media. Newspaper business is expensive business. TV is expensive. It's owned by three people or two and a half people. They control who's going to be on TV. Look at the channels. Is there any truth in the channels? Sir, uh, let me let you me ask you. You can take over a country like this, but sooner or later people are going to react. Sir, my I... question, my question, sir, I sorry to interject, but I need to ask you a question. See, while, while uh, allegations apart, I mean, a lot of uh, things that we talk about are allegations currently, they're not proven. That being said, that being said, sir, sir, uh, uh, the one of the most uh, the, the biggest strength that is spoken about, about uh, the Modi Sarkar, is the fact that uh, India has earned a lot of, uh, lot of credibility, a lot of uh, popularity amongst international, uh, in the globe. How true is that? I think it's a false notion that, you know, NRI is going and filling up Madison Square Gardens. Means that you become popular in America or congregating at the Swaminarayan Temple in London makes you you're popular in England. It means nothing. You don't count in that country. And then they're playing you for chum. He goes to France, he buys planes. He goes to England, he's ordering something. He goes to America, he wants to buy planes. You know, these people are also there for doing business and making chumps of us. They're playing the game well, but you know, Behind his back, maybe who knows what they are saying. But end of the day, sir. Look at how Obama laughed at his suit with his with his name embroidered on it. That was on that's on was on TV those days, and he laughed loudly. He said, "Oh, your name is on your." So, you know, you can't kid yourself that, you know, India, because a few NRIs are jumping around. 
and you know, saying howdy Modi and howdy Trump, you know. I don't believe in all that. The reality is ask your neighbors what they think of you. Go to Sri Lanka, go to Bangladesh, go to Myanmar, go to these countries. What do they think of you? What are they talking of you, thinking about you in Sri Lanka after you make a claim for Kachatibu? Here is a government under whose nose 2,000 square kilometers of land was taken away in Ladakh by the Chinese. And Kachatibu is 1.6 kilometers long and 300 meters wide. It's a sandbank most of the time. So it's less than one square kilometer. And it says, Indra Gandhi ne de diya. Kachatibu was under the collector of Commissionerate of Jaffna from 1920. In, 19, in 2024, 104 years later, you have a man who says, I want Kachatibu. What is he going to do with Kachatibu? You got the Vatge Bank in exchange for it. Indra Gandhi got a great deal. She got the economic rights on the Vatge Bank, which is several hundred square kilometers of, of sea. You don't talk about it. So this is the kind of half-truth goes to Tamil Nadu, Kachatibu. He goes somewhere else and says something else. Now, you keep talking about Guzbaitis in uh, you address Bengalis as Guzbaitis. Who are the Guzbaitis in South India? Outside Hyderabad, all the labor is from Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. There are no jobs there. They're, they're all coming here. Do the South do we South Indians now have to refer to them as Guzbaitis? Bengalis don't come here. Because Bangladesh's economic growth is faster than ours. And Bangladesh's GDP, uh, per capita GDP will cross ours in, in another year or so. So what is your economic performance? Today, India is in a position where it can't even tell its best friend, Modi can't tell his best friend, Netanyahu to stop bombing in Gaza. India is one of the few countries that hasn't spoken on it. Even, asked for a, even America is asking for a ceasefire. India has not asked for it. Where is your prestige? Where are your principles? Where is our standing in the world? The standing in the world is when you stand up. Just because the Palestinians are, belong to a certain religion, and 29,000 get killed doesn't mean that you know it's, it's fine. It's a question of humanity there. Now, India has lost its voice. India used to keep talking about Security Council. What is happening? Have they spoken about it? Has anybody offered India that? Has Biden offered it to us? Has even little Sunak offered it to us? So what is the prestige they're talking about? The prestige comes when your economy is growing at eight or nine percent, like and you know you are competing with China, and you know you're 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 showing decisiveness, principled positions on, on different issues. We are in a position that where we even can't call for a ceasefire in Ukraine. Don't support Russia. Don't support Ukraine. Say that stop fighting. Offer mediation. You've got relations with both countries. Sir, may I ask you a question here, sir? Sir, a lot of things that you spoke about, which is uh, uh, correct. But the point is, somewhere down the line, these are not things that started now, is it? I mean, uh, you know, it is not that we had this great uh, power over the world and uh, the earlier governments, including the UPA government or the BJP government before that, or, you know, had this huge power over the world where we could uh, command countries and we could demand things from countries. We never had it. So we nothing much has changed, has it? I must have had standing and prestige. Nobody, nobody took Indra Gandhi for granted. Nobody took Vajpayee for granted. Nobody took Manmohan Singh 
all the U.S. presidents used to call Manmohan Singh sir. Obama, Bush, everybody called him sir. Cameron called him sir. We were respectful man, we were gravitas. I didn't particularly care for Manmohan Singh's many of his policies, but it was gravitas. It was taken seriously. Don't people in America and England and all see this man shouting and screaming about Kachatipu? Would Manmohan Singh ever done that? And you have a treaty with that country. So what is your treaty worth? Today all these newspapers in Sri Lanka bashed him up. And you give seven million dollars to Sri Lanka at a time when the country was collapsing and you're getting kicked in that country today. This is the kind of government he's running. Maldives asked you to go. I said, I won't send tourists. He says, I'll open Lak Lakshwadeep up. Lakshwadeep doesn't have that holding capacity. How many tourists can go to Lakshwadeep? So he goes to Lakshwadeep, puts on a dining diving suit and goes into the sea. Now, this kind of, you know, childishness doesn't suit behave the office of Prime Minister. Prime Minister of India has to behave with dignity. Even Prime Ministers like Chandrasekhar and all who were there for a few months behaved with great dignity and carried it their office with great dignity when they went abroad. Chandrasekhar went for the SARC summit, which took place in Maldives, in, incidentally. There was so much of respect Nawaz Sharif and all met him. And here, you know, he goes, arrives in Promptu in Karachi, in, in, in Lahore, to go and shake hands with Nawaz Sharif. What happened? What did you get out of it? Grandstanding doesn't work in politics, in international politics. You go to show economic growth, you go to show that you're a good investment destination, you are a good exporter, you're a good trading partner. Where is our standing on all that? Sir, uh, tell me, if you were to, uh, you were to evaluate uh, Mr. Jay Shankar's uh, external policies, his uh, his dealings with uh, uh, our neighbors and across the globe, how would you rate it? Not very high. He's uh, constantly trying to suck up to the Prime Minister. A man who he knows about Kachatibu, why hasn't he spoken? He knows there's a treaty. He knows what India got in return. Just by being smart alecky with a few Western journalists doesn't enhance India's standing. Good English does not enhance India's standing. And you know, this service to the country is very different from service to an individual. They confuse this. And you know, I never expected much more than that, than that you know. Uh, I don't think, you know, too many of his friends and colleagues in the Foreign Service think very differently. Sir, in, in, in last 10 years, uh, there must be something that we gained. There must be something that uh, Narendra Modi did. What is that one thing that you would you would say that you would appreciate what happened in the next uh, last uh, 10 years? He, he raised the issue of the dirt and squalor India lives in. Lack of toilets, lack of sewage, but didn't do anything about it, couldn't do anything about it. None of your toilets are being used. You are a typical Modi. If you want people to use toilets, you're going to have local government. If you want sewage pipes, drains to be cleaned, you're going to have local government. Do you know that 40% of our wage bill in this country goes to central government employees, another 45% goes to state government employees, and only 11 
10 to 11 percent goes to local government. So at the level at which people deal with government, there is no government. There is no municipality in this country which comes in. Who cleans the garbage off your streets? If you, there's a drain not clogged and a sewage overflowing in front of your house, it takes days to get it cleaned. Where is local government? So he's building toilets. People are using toilets to store goods now. I travel around the countryside very often, very often. I don't see any toilets being used. It's actually much cleaner to go into the fields. But you know, he, we thought at least the cities will be clean. There will be decentralization of government. There's no decentralization, very centralized government. So your know, centralization and decentralization comes on where the who's getting the money, who's getting paid. Do you know that at the time of economic reform in China, the central government accounted for 70% of the expenditures. Today, the central government in Beijing controls only 30% of the expenditures. 70% is down in the provinces. Now, nothing has happened in it, no decentralization. One of the cardinal points on which the BJP is to function is to democratic decentralization. That we will have village governments, we will have district governments, where is the talk about it? Where is the talk about it? We have totally centralized around one personality. This is like we could be in dealing with Mr. Stalin. So personality <laughs> is dangerous for democracy. Wherever Correct. personality is removed, democracy is destroyed. Going and rolling in a temple and matha takeaway and doing all that does not make you a better man. Hitler and was an avid church goer. Sir, I want to I want to inter, uh, interrupt here and ask you a question. We are talking about democracy, and I want to ask you. Uh, basically, you've seen uh, the, the the Vajpayee government of Bharatiya Janata Party, and now you're seeing the Modi government of Bharatiya Janata Party. You've seen both of them very closely. Tell me, sir, the the difference in constitutional position then and the difference in constitutional positioning position now. The difference of what's happening with governor-state relationship versus the different what happened during those days, uh, the the center-state relationship. How is how is it uh, how is it how how has it changed? You see, Vajpayee was a great respecter of conventions and norms. He believed that governors cannot override elected governments. Governors were only a constitutional institution which lent a certain continuity, just like the president. But but they were at a higher pedestal. They were not supposed to misuse their office. Today, do, uh, do state governments, where the BJP governs, do they have trouble with governors? Why is there trouble in Kerala? Why is there trouble in Tamil Nadu? Even if the minister is a rogue, if the chief minister wants to make him a minister, you swear him in. It's not for the governor to say no. It's not for Mr. Arif Muhammad Khan to say that so-and-so will not be a vice chancellor. It never happened. It doesn't happen in other states. I mean, you, have, you mean uh, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh don't have riffraff as vice chancellors? And no governor has raised a voice? So why only in non-BJP states? So, I, you know, it would have never happened in Vajpayee's time. There were opposition governments in Vajpayee's time. I remember when I was in the finance ministry, chief ministers of other states would come, but received well. Quite often, the minister would tell me, so and so is coming, just go down and receive him and bring him up here. So, these are opposition governments. 
and in their first national executive meeting, the BJP government, at that time, the first sentence said, we believe that government is a continuum. That was the first sentence. That just because Narsimara was gone, doesn't mean that everything else goes away. Sir, then may I ask you a question? If Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee had 303 seats in the parliament, uh, would things be different? Was this? If Atal Bihari Vajpayee said, I was asking you, if Atal Bihari Vajpayee had 303 seats in the parliament, would he be singing? Would he be the same person? Would he be? Would it be the same policy, or things would have been different? Was, you know, he was, you know, number one in the party. But when the party said no, that conversion will not be registered by district collectors, he said okay. It's a democratic temperament of listening to the majority, listening to the voice of reason. Does the governor of the RBI, does his opinion matter on demonetization? Or is he just told one hour before, okay, surrender your mobile phone, I'm going to demonetize it. It was not even demonetization. It was a note, note change. He broke the back of the economy. If you're a democratic man, there would have been a discussion, there would have been talk on this. And these things have been done in other countries. France and Europe removed the 100, the 100 euro note, 500 euro note, because it was being stashed up by people to give money. And what happened here? 99.8% of the money came back to the RBI. Did you talk about it? And here is the Prime Minister who said, give me 50 days, otherwise burn me. Was it a great success? You can go to Ladakh, the Chinese are in occupation of a territory, and say, Chinese don't hold any Indian territory, Indian controlled territory. Of course they don't hold Indian controlled territory. They have gone into territory which both countries were claiming, and we were not entering. We just went in and sat down. You didn't know they were coming, didn't you have a pair of binoculars? I asked the, one of the army bosses on TV, when we were in a discussion. I said, you know, you didn't see them coming on the north bank of the Pangong. There's only five, five kilometers wide. You just need a new pair of binoculars. You, know, you can't pretend, you can't fool a country like this. And now China is laying claim to the whole of Arunachal Pradesh. The whole of Arunachal Pradesh. It never happened before. They were claiming Taman. Today, China is redrawing the maps, renaming places. Itanagar is called something else. Vijayanagar is called something else. Would it have happened before? If you were Vishwa Guru, very powerful, big, strong country, would China have behaved like this? Sir, but let me also ask you the question, sir. Chinese has always uh, been known to intrude uh, Indian uh, sovereignty. I mean, it is not the first thing, first time it's happening. Uh, secondly, India never shared a great relationship with China. Thirdly, China was not much of a, 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 a country that is known to respect uh, international borders. So I what is it different now? Sorry. I tell you what happened. India and China had two different perceptions of what the line of control was. Our line of control was behind their line of control. Or their line of control was behind our line of control. So we had overlapping lines of control. So we said we will not station troops in them between permanently. There should be no man's land. But we could patrol up to our perceived LOC and they could patrol up to their perceived LOC. The patrols never confronted each other. So it was a game being played for 20, 25, 30 years. And we used to go, they used to sit back, and they used to come, we used to sit back. We never had any problem. 
Suddenly the Chinese have sat down and said, we won't go back. They come on a patrol and not going back. That's how they occupy territory. And you don't have the gumption to throw them out. You don't have the gumption to go and sit in other places or, you know, outflank them. Not only that, China, China was claiming the Taiwan track all along, loudly, vociferously. Now it is claiming the whole of Arunachal Pradesh. Not only that, it's claiming the part of Bhutan below the Tawang, a place called the Sakteng Tract. So that it will have an open line from Tibet, Chinese controlled Tibet, into Assam place. The government has a policy on it. Have they spoken? Why don't the policy of Tibet change? Now you have a Dalai Lama sitting inside India who is 88 years old. They might call him the living God, but he's not God. He's a human being like you and me. Long past the age of some where human beings live. And you will have another Dalai Lama around very soon. Chinese will choose one. The Tibetans here will choose one. Who will be the Dalai Lama? Then there will be a conflict. Have you a policy on that? Have you thought about that? Sir, but uh, tell me, my last question, we've got uh, four more minutes to go. My last question, sir, is then how do you see the latest uh, Congress manifesto? How do you see uh, the late, uh, this thing? And do you think uh, there is uh, a, a lot of thought got into it? In a democracy, governments are thrown out. Governments are not brought in. I saw what happened in Tirangana. The man had transformed the state. Telangana was to be barren, dry, bone dry state. He turned it into green fields everywhere, water everywhere. The largest irrigation projects in this country took place in Telangana in the last 10 years. GDP doubled, highest, fastest growing GDP of a state in, in the country. But it became arrogant, surrounded himself with family and people of a certain community. Perceived as arrogant, lost by 2%, but lost. When the blow comes, it comes very fast. Arrogance will cost governments their heads. You think when there's a prime minister jetting around the country in Rajasthan in the morning, Uttar Pradesh at tea time, 11 o'clock break, coming back to Madhya Pradesh at 2 o'clock. Who's working? Who's minding the store? People are not watching all this. They're not watching, like during the emergency, um, Sanjay Gandhi used to be on TV every day. What little TV we had. Menaka Gandhi, Sanjay Gandhi, got it as the new hope for it. So he's gone through, as they say, Sanatan Dhamka Deshi. We absorb all these things and you know, they act when the time comes. I personally don't think this government is going to do better than the last time. We'll be very hard pressed. So, you know, countries have a way of, India has a way of dealing with it. Sir, my question still Absolutely. remains, how would you rate uh, Congress's manifesto? Congress's manifesto is the usual bit of populism. And, you know, Nyai is a good part. Basic income is a good part. Of it. And but you know, one lakh to every household we will give them. You know, there's to be a limit to populism. But they're promising it because this whole game has now become populist. We should have a system where we you have to show ways and means. Okay, you're going to do this, where are you going to get money from? Modi says I'm feeding the whole of the country. Where is the money coming from? Remember the man said. Petrol went up to 67 rupees a litre. He said, Nikami Sarkar. We said, you're buying it 107 a litre in Hyderabad. And he got away with it. People said, you know, petrol will come down. Baba Ramdev said the rupee will, the dollar will be equal to only 40 rupees. And what is the other guy in Bangalore? 
Radha Swami, he also said that. Ravi Shankar, Sri Sri. They got endorsements like that. So, you know, government gets thrown out. And I have a feeling that how opens is coming. Sir, thank you so much. Thank you so much for talking to me. It was indeed a pleasure talking to you. And I would like to see you soon again in the channel. Thank you so much for talking to me, sir. Nice talking to you.